Hello, everyone, and welcome to Community Bookstore's virtual event series. My name is Hal Lavinka. I'm the event director at the bookstore, and I'm absolutely thrilled today to get to welcome George Packer for the release of Last Best Hope, America in Crisis and Renewal, in conversation with Thomas Chatterton Williams. Uh, while the pandemic has taken a toll on all of our lives, events like the one you're about to see have become bright spots in our days. I want to give a huge thanks to our guests for joining us this evening, especially to George, one of our favorite locals. Uh, so to some housekeeping, you should be able to see and hear our presenters, but they cannot see or hear you. So if you have any questions, please click on the Q&A button here at the bottom of the screen to submit them. We'll be asking those at the end of the program. There's also a chat button here through which I'll be posting a link to buy tonight's books, very important. Uh, a caveat for tonight's event and for all virtual events, we're we're all at the mercy of our home internet connections and server loads, so please bear with any technical issues that could arise. Uh, we will try to solve them quickly. And we've scheduled a whole host of summer programming, so head over to our website and sign up for a newsletter to stay up to date. Um, one that I do want to point out, next Tuesday, June 22nd, we are thrilled to be collaborating again with our friends at New York Review Books to welcome Joshua Cohen for the release of his scathing and brilliant and increasingly timely new novel, The Netanyahu's, in conversation with Corey Robin. Uh, that program is up on our website now and taking registrations. Uh, and finally, I'm going to enable Zoom's auto transcribe setting once we get going. So if you have your version of Zoom is up to date, hit the live transcription button at the bottom of your screen to enable that. So now a little about tonight's guest and we'll get started. George Packer is an award whoop. George Packer is an award-winning author and staff writer at The Atlantic. His previous books include The Unwinding, An Inner History of the New America, winner of the National Book Award, The Assassin's Gate, America in Iraq, and Our Man, Richard Holbrook and the End of the American Century, which was the winner of the Hitchens Prize and the Los Angeles Times Book Prize for Biography. He's also the author of two novels and a play and the editor of a two-volume edition of the Essays of George Orwell. And Thomas Chatterton Williams is the author of Losing My Cool and Self-Portrait in Black and White. He is a contributing editor at the New York Times Magazine, a columnist at Harper's and a 2019 New America Fellow and a visiting fellow at AEI. His work has appeared in the New Yorker, the, New Yorker, the London Review of Books, Le Monde, and many other places, and has been collected in the Best American Essays and the Best American Travel Writing. He lives in Paris with his wife and two children. And his next book, Nothing Was the Same, The Pandemic Summer of George Floyd and the Shift in Western Consciousness, will be published by Knopf. So... Turning the stage over to you. Well, thank you so much, Hal. Hey, George, it's amazing to be <laughs> talking with you about another book that you've uh, that you've written uh, hey, while Thomas. I'm still trying to <laughs> to work on mine. Um, thank you for doing this past midnight your time. You're you're a great friend to do it. I wouldn't miss it. Um, and yeah, I just I, I, it's the second time I've read this book. It's really impressive to me uh, on so many levels. One of which is the kind of sweep of erudition that you're able to fit into a taut, tight um, book that wears its learning um, very lightly. Um, I was wondering if you wanted to maybe um, say a few words about it or read a passage, and then we'll get into a conversation before finishing with a Q&A from the audience. Sure. Thanks, Thomas. Um, this is a COVID book. It was uh, conceived and written during the pandemic when I was trapped in front of a screen and couldn't do do any traveling couldn't do much reporting so it's an unusual book for me because it isn't a reported book it's not a research book it's it's an essay it's actually i think of it as like a political pamphlet in the tradition of political pamphlets short books that come out in the middle of a crisis and that try to say something about it make an intervention in order to push people's thinking in a certain direction so i'm just going to read the first few paragraphs of at the start of the book and, and then we can talk about it I am an American. No, I don't want pity. In the long story of our experiment in self-government, the world's pity has taken the place of admiration, hostility, awe, envy, fear, affection, and repulsion. Pity is more painful than any of these, and after pity comes indifference, which would be intolerable. I know a woman who said of her own husband and children, they're not the people I would choose to be quarantined with. Are my fellow citizens the people I choose to be quarantined with? Well, there's no choice. They're mine and I'm theirs. During the time of separation, we Americans with our dollars and easy smiles and loud voices have not been welcome abroad. US passports once worth stealing are no good. Formerly mobile, we've been trapped with ourselves and one another. A lot of Americans have explored their options for expatriation a deceased Irish grandfather, a suddenly promising Canadian girlfriend, an open invitation from the government of Ghana, a loophole in New Zealand citizenship law. 
As for me, I'm staying put. And not just because these exit strategies are not available to me. I want to see how it all turns out for my children, if not myself. Whether a huge multi-everything democracy can survive or will perish from the earth is a matter of interest, and not only for us. The virus gave us this one gift. It interrupted us. The mask wearing, the grocery wiping, the regretted handshake, the risk in this muffled person headed my way on the sidewalk. It became impossible to pass through the world in the normal bovine manner. The virus forced us to look at ourselves and for once pay the kind of attention that we've always taken for granted from, for, from others. I don't mean the image check of a teenager glancing at a smartphone screen or store window. This attention is a long middle-aged stare in the mirror at a face rising from a dark background. It's not the face I expect to see. Vertical etchings under the cheekbones, the color of exhaustion around the eyes, what's left of the hair badly in need of professional organizing. Instead of the calm wisdom expected by now, there's an expression of uncertainty, a hint of muted panic. The stare brings a shock of estrangement. Don't look too long or I'll stop knowing who this is. The time of separation made us strangers, not just to one another, but to ourselves. A young girl told her parents that she felt unreal. She wanted to stay in bed so that it would all seem like a bad dream from which she'd wake up. And when we do, when we finally come out of hiding and take off our masks, we will ask, who are we? What's happened to us? Is this the beginning of the end or a new beginning? What do we do now? Thank you for that. I love that intro. Um, Thank you. And maybe I'll just start off by asking you about, you know, you, you, you mentioned that this is kind of in the tradition of democratic vistas or, or, or one of these political pamphlets, and it was written fast and under very strange circumstances during confinement. What was that like for you as a writer? And how was that? Was that something that in some ways made the writing easier, the, the urgency of the issue and the, and the time frame? Yeah, I mean, on the one hand, it was liberating because I had a short time to do it. I had a short book to write. I didn't have masses, piles of notebooks and transcripts and recordings and readings to try to assimilate. And um, it was like, say what you think right now. What are you thinking right now? Say it. So there was a kind of uh, impulsiveness and directness that mm -hmm. was sort of exciting and um, maybe brought me back to my earlier days as a writer when before I came under the very uh, stringent discipline of, of magazine work. Mm -hmm. um, and, and yet it was also really hard because I didn't have a built-in narrative to follow. Mm -hmm. Every page, every paragraph was a kind of high wire act because I had to think, I had to come up with ideas. And in a book like this, it really is the ideas as well as the prose that carry the reader or the reader's going to leave you. I always feel like I'm about to lose the reader any second and I have to keep making sure that there's energy and there's tension and there's um, excitement or else they're going to abandon me. And in this case, it was particularly hard because there was no story to tell. Telling a story is a natural form for me. But in this case, um, I only had my own mind to draw on. And that's that's sort of a scary thought because sometimes you come up empty. But you, I mean, you did have, the world provided you with some crazy events <laughs> um, to draw on. But it's, it's true, that, you know, your last book, uh, a sprawling novelistic uh, biography of the diplomat Richard Holbrook was in many ways about the end of uh, sheer American dominance and confidence, this era of the 20th century. And it was often looking out into the world Whereas this book is looking inward, um, it's taut and concise, and it's about really trying to hold us, hold ourselves together and survive. The two seem almost like physically to represent different eras uh, um, and, and to complement each other in a way to me. Do you see them as linked in any way? I think I'm always writing about America and Americans and my last four, five books, including this one, that's been really the theme of all of them. The, the book this is most connected to is The Unwinding, which came before the Holbrook biography, which was immersive reporting, um, a lot of storytelling about sort of left behind forgotten regions of the country where people felt disconnected from power and 
from uh, money. Um, and in that book, I saw in the in the work on that book, I saw the institutions of our democracy failing and not connecting to people and not helping people and people um, feeling as if it was a con game, a kind of rigged system that had nothing for them. And that all came to me as sort of a shock because it was in the midst of the first term of Obama when there was still a fair amount of optimism about the future of the country. So I began to get a kind of dark view of America from the work on the unwinding. And last, and the Holbrook book then goes back earlier from World War II really to Afghanistan. It's a, the American century was that 60 year right. period. Last Best Hope returns to some of the material of the unwinding, but it does so in a different way. It's, it's more of an essay kind of style. It uh, does more analyzing. Um, it has a first person voice, which mm -hmm. the unwinding did not have. The unwinding allowed all the characters to speak for themselves. But here, I'm the one telling you um, where we're going and what we're doing. And so it's very much in the style of essay writing. And some of my favorite essayists like Baldwin and Orwell are always in my head when I'm writing in this, in this mode. Um, and it was also written, I began it right before the election. Um, it was an incredibly frightening time. We were still in the thick of the pandemic. We were facing the possibility of a second Trump term, which I thought of as the end of mm -hmm. our democracy and of possible violence. I mean, people were arming up. I even thought maybe I should get a gun, <laughs> this, seriously. And my wife said, no, you're not gonna do that. Um, it, it felt, and, I, and people had conversations like, you think there's gonna be a civil war? That was a normal conversation in October of 2020. Mm -hmm. um, I didn't think there would be lines of troops uh, shooting each other across a creek. I thought there might be widespread violence um, whipped up by Trump and by the nihilistic forces on the right. It didn't happen quite to that degree, although January 6th was uh, violent enough for most of us. Um, I had a sense of dread when I began the book and I wanted to write both a really unvarnished, brutally honest account as much as I could of how this happened. How did we get here? Not just 2020, which is the first part of the book, the year of COVID and the election and the protests, but 50 years that led to 2020. But in the last part of the book, I felt a really deep urgency to write about how we could rebuild uh, our democracy and come out of this. And so I look to the past for sources of inspiration and, and understanding. I read a lot of Tocqueville. I read um, Walter Lippmann and Francis Perkins, who was Roosevelt's Secretary of Labor, Bayard Rustin, who was a great civil rights figure. Um, we've been through this before. We've been even in more uh, near-death experiences, closer to death than we are now. But it was kind of affirming almost to watch Americans in earlier times deal with some of the same mm -hmm. critical issues and find their way through them and give examples to us that we can use, even though we, we have to live in our own moment. So the book was, yeah, it was an intense experience that really began with the fear of the pre-election period and ended with the, the really cautious hope of the Biden inauguration and the beginning of, right. of the end of the pandemic. So it was it was an intense three month uh, arc that yeah. uh, I think I'm still recovering from. <clears throat> I do feel like the ending does have a slightly more optimistic note than the beginning does. That, that's palpable. I don't know if it's because I was talking to you throughout the period, but it does. I, I, I feel good when the book, by the time the book is over, even though you've taken us through quite a lot of what's wrong with us. Um, I do have that stubborn American hope that I think that you're also, you know, um, um, dealing with. Uh, but, you know, the idea of self-government that you draw on from Tocqueville that's central to the book and in, indeed is something that probably would have sounded self-evident to many readers in the past. But today, at least on the left, we don't hear many people speaking about this idea that, as you point out, is really a kind of art form. Um, and then on the right, there is an obsession with a kind of negative freedom embodied in the slogan, don't tread on me, which you argue is a kind of shallow isolation. So what exactly is self-government and why is it so crucial that we recommit ourselves to this skill? 
I use self-government more than I use democracy in the book. They're sort of seen as, as meaning the same thing. I think of self-government as democracy in action. It's what people under democracy do or should do together in order to solve their common problems. Uh, and Tocqueville did call it an art. He saw it as something that had to be learned. It's not natural at all. In fact, throughout most of human history, it didn't exist. And it feels all the more fragile today than even a year or two ago. Um, it's something that has to be learned and relearned and can easily be forgotten or cast aside, which is something that Americans, some Americans seem willing to do right now. Um, because it's hard, it requires a lot of almost contradictory uh, impulses. You have to think for yourself, that's crucial. And yet you also have to grant others the autonomy of their own views so that you don't agree with them, but you just sort of in some basic way grant that there's going to be other views. There's pluralism. Um, it means being able to argue without wanting to kill each other. It means being able to compromise and know when not to compromise. Um, and I keep going back to this speech that Lincoln gave when uh, he was very young, just a new uh, state legislator in Illinois um, after there had been a, the killing of an abolitionist minister in Southern Illinois, he gave a, a speech in Springfield and he said, you know, we will not be conquered by some Napoleon striding across the Atlantic and drinking from the Ohio River. If uh, destruction be our lot, we must be its author or finisher. We shall live as free men for all time or die by suicide. Suicide is um, a powerful metaphor for what democracies can do. And it's absolutely relevant to what's been happening in this country. We haven't been conquered from abroad. I would say we haven't even been conquered by Donald Trump. I think we've contributed to our own destruction in, in a lot of ways. And I wanted to look hard at the ways in which Trump is a failure on the part of the whole country, not just one part of the country. Um, and uh, so self-government is the unnatural art form that free people have to practice. Uh, and it's related to equality in an interesting way, because I think without equality, without the sense that we are all as good as each other, all have the same rights and opportunities and status, self-government is going to fail in this country. And it's happened again and again because we've never lived up to the code of equality. It's the hidden code that creates a sense of shared citizenship. And without it, self-government is going to fail here. It's not true in other countries, but I feel that this country, it's the first key word of the Declaration of Independence. It was the what Tocqueville called the, the uh, ardent desire of Americans. The most striking thing about us is our passion for equality. So equality is integral with self-government, but equality also drives us apart because each of us is pursuing our own destiny in this country. It's our famous individualism. And if we take it too far, that individualism leads to incredible inequality without any sense of having a common destiny. Um, and so in a way, equality is both the necessary ingredient for self-government, and it can also be a threat to self-government if we lose the track of the true equality that holds us together. That common thread, yeah. And I mean, the, the framework that you developed to talk about how we've kind of come apart, uh, I, I wanna get into because it's really interesting. You break down American society into four Americas or four narratives of American life, free America, smart America, real America, and what you call just America. Um, smart America is in many ways a global phenomenon, what the British writer David Goodhart described as people from uh, nowhere, as opposed to people from somewhere or, or real America in your analysis. Um, but what I found so interesting were the ways you pointed out smart America, who tend to be Democrats, can overlap with libertarian free America, who are Republicans, because they both embrace capitalism, meritocracy, and individualism. And it made me wonder if you see the opportunity for, for new uh, alignments or alliances, um, for example, these two Americas finding common ground in opposition to identity ext extremism or xenophobic populism. And you, know, you also draw some parallels between uh, real America and just America and their frustrations with this too. 
Exactly. So first, I want to say that that, that section of the book was excerpted in, in the Atlantic and right. excerpt um, did justice to that section, but it didn't do justice to the whole book. So I want to say about that notion of the four Americas, mm -hmm. this is not an ethnography that tries to capture the whole country. So a lot of people are left out because these are the dominant narratives, these four. And almost by definition, they're going to leave out a lot of people, including, for the most part, working class people who don't have the clout and the cultural um, capital to influence um, the narrative that the narratives that drive us. So at the end of the book, we'll talk about this afterward. I try to find a narrative that doesn't leave them out. Mm -hmm. But these four, in some ways, have a chronology. Free America, I think, comes from the 70s and 80s. It's Reagan's America. It's consumer capitalism um, on, on steroids. And it's negative freedom. It's the freedom of leave me alone so I can make money. Get the government out of my life. Uh, and it began with a kind of limited sense of limited government, but it really took a turn toward nihilistic anti-government um, feeling. And it, while it certainly created prosperity in some areas and freed up people from the malaise of the 70s, it also created massive inequality and corporate consolidation into monopolies, and it disempowered workers, destroyed the union movement, what was left of it. So it, in the end, did not answer the, the real needs of the country. And that's good. That's true of all four of them. They have their own value, but they also have some basic flaw or blindness that creates winners and losers. Smart America in some ways follows chronologically because I see it as the, um, the ethos of the Clintons, uh, of educated people, professional people during the 90s. Um, the, the Democratic Party really became, to, lar to a large degree, the party of educated professionals. Mm -hmm. And that was not true just 20 years earlier. Um, it was a big shift and it's gotten more dramatic over time up, up till now. Education is really the dividing line between the two parties today. Uh, the most, I would say, not the only one, but the most um, de decisive one. Meritocracy sounds good. People should be judged on their talents and should get as far as their talents and efforts can take them uh, as measured by things like standardized tests. But once meritocracy becomes a kind of closed system where you're born into a certain family, into a certain neighborhood, school, life, and that and your ticket is almost punched from the start because of all the advantages you're going to get from the start. Um, and that's true more and more in our education system, I think then meritocracy becomes a kind of aristocracy. It's a privilege class rather than a class of the truly deserving. And I think that's happened more and more. One statistic I came across was that today it's no easier for someone from the poorer uh, parts of America to get into one of the top Ivies, Ivy League universities than it was in 1954. We've really made no progress for wow. Or Americans to rise through education than we than we were at in 1954. So it, it's become kind of an entrenched aristocracy. And well, that's I, kind of yeah. oh, sorry. I, no, go I, ahead. I was just going to say that's just America has a critique of smart America along some of these lines. Um, we'll get to that for sure. Yeah. But first, chronologically and also in in the book's order, real America, which is a phrase that I cribbed from Sarah Palin. Mm -hmm. is Sarah Palin's America. It's the Ameri It's white identity politics. It's the America that sees itself as kind of the backbone of the country. And really, to be honest, it's white Christian America in the rural areas, in the small towns, goes back to Jacksonian America. Those were his supporters. William Jennings Bryan, the great populist. There's a long thread, that can, and even George Wallace in a much more virulent form. It's a long thread that connects this um, this narrative, which is a populist narrative, and which in our time saw Sarah Palin as John the Baptist to the coming of Donald Trump. And Trump brought real America to the forefront of our politics. And, um, and yet it's a rebellion against free America because it's a rebellion by ordinary Republican voters against the, um, the shibboleths 
the cliches of Reaganism, free trade, immigration, low taxes, deregulation, none of that really spoke to Sarah Palin's people, <laughs> or even Donald Trump's people, because they were living in deteriorating places in post-industrial cities, in small towns that were decaying and whose main streets had a lot of boarded up shops. So it was really no longer the sunny optimism of Reagan. It had become darker and nativist and, and hostile to groups seen as alien, whether it's the elites on the coast or whether it's black and immigrant Americans or who, who all others. So real America is a rebellion from below against free America. And they've had a very uneasy coexistence in the Republican Party with free America continuing to dominate at the top political levels with Mitch McConnell and the Koch brothers. But real America are the voters and the Republican Party now has to pay homage and, and kowtow to that. And finally, again, chronologically, in the last five or six years, we've seen an explosion of a new narrative that is also an old narrative, which is the narrative of social justice. I call it just America, but it's generational. It's really people under 40 um, who have looked at their parents' promises, their liberal meritocratic parents' promises, smart America and their promises and said, bullshit, this is a lie. We're not getting better. We're still trapped in the same history we've been in from the beginning. So let's look at that history. And Just America is quite, is, is deeply uh, interested in American history, but as a source of criticism of our system because it is full of injustice and full of inequality. Um, and Just America is a rebellion against smart America, just as real America is a rebellion against free America. It's a rebellion against the meritocracy. So now there's a whole generation of young people who don't believe in meritocracy. Um, and even though they're gonna continue to run on the treadmill of the rat race and take the tests and try to get into the colleges, there's something hollow about it now. It's seen mm -hmm. as a kind of inauthentic pursuit and the authentic pursuit is the pursuit of justice. And that has become the narrative, I think, of, a, of the younger generation. And for that reason, it's a powerful one. And I, I mean, you're obviously a member, uh, if we have to group you, you're a member of Smart America, but I wonder, and it's not necessarily clear to me, where, where do your sympathies uh, lie or whose struggle, um, I guess, um, you seem to be hard on your own group, is what I guess I'm getting yeah. at. You're very critical of Smart America. I am, I am, because I think there's a great deal of complacency mm -hmm. and hypocrisy and also a kind of spinelessness because when it comes down to it, I have a line in the book um, that says, um, achievement is, a, is too fragile a basis for moral yes. identity yeah. for people to stand up for their own worth when they're under attack. Yeah, I, 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 do I dog-eared that. Yeah, yeah, it's a, it's a very interesting insight. I haven't quite got it right, but it's something like that. And what I mean is when meritocrats come under attack and they are under attack now in so many of our institutions, universities, the media, um, the arts, philanthropy and politics, they cave. They don't wanna, it turns out that the liberal values that they seem to stand for are very fragile. Mm -hmm. And when an illiberal force challenges them, um, they may well not be able to stand up to it. And that's a, a weakness of meritocracy. It shows that it isn't built on a strong foundation um, of values. So I am hard on this on smart America. I think in a weird way, and I'm also hard on free America because I think it has devastated mm -hmm. large parts of this country. It's created so much inequality and so much pain and suffering while offering the same mantra like a cargo cult, low taxes, deregulation. I mean, you, you could read that on the homepage of the Heritage Foundation or um, the Cato Institute year after year, no matter what the hell is going on and no matter what facts tell right. you, no, that's not true. Low taxes actually have not created jobs. It's been in periods of high taxes on the wealthy that we've had job creation. So those are the two that I think get my juices going, my hostile juices to some extent. Um, real and just, I'm most threatened by because mm. they are the most potent right now. 
they have the energy of the new um, and of populism and of kind of contempt for the previous generation. And no one wants to be cast aside or told that you're irrelevant or um, told that uh, the world belongs to us, not you. So in, yeah, in some ways they're threatening. And I think maybe my portrait of both of them has a certain um, angst in it and maybe even intensity to it that reflects that. I'm actually sort of sympathetic to both, far more to just America than to real America. But even real America, I feel some sympathy for the, the motive that, it, that, that goes into it that is a, a kind of anger at the elites for their contempt, for leaving them behind, for not caring, for thinking of them as inferior Americans, which is real. I really don't like real America's attitude toward non-white Americans. That's its downfall. Right. That is what makes it so toxic and poisonous in our body politic. Um, just America, I'm really sympathetic to the desire to force America to confront a racial history that we really have never confronted. White Americans have never been willing to face it. Just America is forcing us to face it, but it's doing so in a way that herds us into identity groups, that erases our individuality, that can become quite coercive in some ways, morally mm -hmm. coercive. No one is cracking the whip or uh, hurting people into jails, but morally and socially, there's a lot of pressure to fall in or you will be um, shamed. And that's not, a, to me, a, a way to build a free society, a liberal society. So those two have my attention. Like those are the ones that I'm most seized with and think about all the time and try to come to some kind of equanimity with. Yeah. But you raised some interesting um, contradictions within the smart and just America. For example, in smart America, you mentioned that unions hardly exist. And it put me in mind of, of the New Yorker, which is a quintessential smart American institution. And the yeah. gap between the kind of values that a publication like that, and not to single them out, but the, the gap between the values that they espouse and then what they're actually willing to concede to their least powerful employees. Uh, and I wonder what is behind this kind of contradiction between theory and practice yeah. in this segment of society, in your, in your opinion. I mean, unions don't exist in smart America because the, the, the important unit is the individual and individual talent. And unions are all about um, commonality and solidarity. Um, plus, unions seem like dinosaurs in the in the Clinton years, they pretty much faded from the scene. I mean, the unions were like some cigar smoking, corrupt AFL-CIO boss. Um, unions today have got a new energy. They mm -hmm. are full of the energy of social justice. And uh, unions at the Times, the New Yorker, and now at the Atlantic, which just uh, right. organized, uh, where I work, just organized. So I am uh, now, I don't know if it is, it, today, but or very soon will be a member of, uh, of a union. And I, I want to be because I think younger journalists need mm -hmm. collective bargaining and collective support in order to have a chance in a very difficult mm -hmm. profession. I mean, an industry that has suffered so many uh, devastating blows in the last 20 or 30 years. What I don't love is and I, we saw this at the New York Times, is a, a spirit that is not just about empowering workers, but it seems also to be about um, keeping them in an, a political orthodoxy. And mm -hmm. if you stray from that orthodoxy, or if you make a mistake, or if you refuse to swear by it, right. you might find yourself on the wrong side of your own union or of your own colleagues. And those colleagues may not have a, a view that you have a right to your own disagreement. They may think that you uh, are not fit to be their colleague. And we've seen examples of that. That you're being held so, to account, yeah, yeah. Yeah, so in that sense, uh, the, the new journalistic unions have both what's best, I think, about the, the union in American tradition mm -hmm. and also some of the aspects of, um, 
of America today that make me uneasy. Mm -hmm. I, um, I recently shared on Twitter what a friend pointed out seems like a, a surprisingly good example of your assertion that just America uh, is concerned with language and identity more than material conditions. Um, there was this long piece in the Washington Post entitled The Racist Legacy Many Birds Carry. Um, it was a piece about birds that are named after unsavory historical characters, and it necessarily put me in mind of a Times article from two years ago about how presently one third of all birds in North America, about three bir billion birds in total, have just vanished. And it strikes me that we're worrying about semantics and renaming these animals that may not even exist much longer uh, because of much more serious underlying problems that we don't seem to have the mental bandwidth to deal with. And it seems yeah. like you get at the, the crux of, of something that's very wrong in this, in this moment, even though, even though I think nobody would object to the idea that, yeah, we should think about, you know, some of the, you know, historical legacies of oppression that, you know, even names carry, but, but it seems like we're not keeping things in perspective. Right, the emphasis is so entirely on um, gestures and symbols, mm -hmm. um, in some ways on performance, that I sometimes wonder uh, when Just America is gonna create justice because that's, I don't think that's how you do it. Um, Just America is very concerned with language and with um, subjective experience. And this comes from both the theoretical background of just America, because in some ways, each of these four Americas, especially free and just have an intellectual uh, context. Free America, it's the libertarian philosophers of the mid 20th century. And just America, it's the postmodern philosophers of the late 20th century, uh, which led to critical studies and black studies, feminist studies, et cetera, in American universities, which is concerned in the spirit of Foucault with identity and with subjectivity um, and not so much in the old Marxist tradition with concrete mm -hmm. material conditions. Um, it also is, I think, draws on an older American history, which is the history of the Puritans who uh, were the, the original yeah. uh, settlers of this country and who saw God in everything and God as expressed in our language in everything and believed that uh, goodness, justice depended on um, each of us purging ourselves of whatever got in the way of that connection to God. And that meant there was a lot of confession of sin. There was a lot of public shaming and repentance or death, <laughs> and then a kind of redemption and salvation that allowed us to be reunited with, uh, with God. And I mean, as I say that, I, I can't help thinking that there's a bit of that in the social justice movement yeah. today. There is a, a strong sense of original sin, especially in white Americans. Um, they, whiteness is now a kind of stand-in for original sin. Um, and it's just as vexing because get rid of your whiteness is now a kind of prompt, uh, uh, a dogma in some circles. And yet, if it's uh, simply the accident of your skin color, first of all, how do you do that? And second, should that be, should we make an essence of the accident of our skin color? just because history has made an essence. The worst aspects of history have made it an essence. Does that mean we should repeat that in the opposite direction? Um, and sometimes I worry that we are making an essence of race um, when race is a construct, not an essence. You've written a great deal about this, Thomas, so I'd rather hear you <laughs> for me to blab. Well, no, I mean, uh, yeah, I certainly share I very much share your um, sensibility, but you know, I, it's someone else that I'd love to talk about before we get into audience questions is at the end of Last Best Hope, you know, you speak admiringly and you mentioned him admiringly and you mentioned him earlier uh, of Bayard Rustin, you know, not, a, not quite an unsung, but I'd say an undersung civil rights hero in, in your conception of what might get us through this in, you know, equal America and making America finally be the country that it's long promised to be. Can you say why he became such a special figure for you 
And I'd say the embodiment of the spirit. First of all, if you read about him or if you read him, it's breathtaking what kind of life he lived. He was a freedom rider years and years before there were anyone knew about freedom riders in the late 40s. He rode an interstate bus and got himself sentenced to 30 days on a North Carolina chain gang. He wrote an incredible narrative about those 30 days and how uh, he turned himself into kind of the indispensable man whom the, the prison guards needed. And he, he himself showed them respect. And in the end, they couldn't help showing him some respect. And yet he was so radical. Um, he was a socialist. He was a Christian. He was uh, a civil rights activist. He was a Gandhian. He brought Gandhi to the civil rights movement more than any other figure. Um, and he was gay. And it was being gay that was his constant downfall. The civil rights leaders could tolerate a lot of things, but that was one thing they couldn't tolerate. And so he was constantly being pushed down when his profile got too large, including by Martin Luther King, who in some ways he never forgave. Um, he organized the March on Washington. That was his great achievement. He was a brilliant strategist. He was not the front man. He wasn't the guy who gave the speech. He was the guy behind the scenes who had the ideas and the strategy and also the philosophy. He understood that the civil rights movement was part of a worldwide struggle for equality. And because equality is, is the key word of my book, mm -hmm. it's moving to me that he uses it in a way that isn't rhetorical alone and isn't um, a simple reference to the Declaration of Independence, but he believes it, that we really are all equal. And at one point in 1969, he was asked by the city of Cleveland mm -hmm. to write a letter to the school children of Cleveland about the wonderful times in which we lived. And in 1969, it was not such a wonderful time. Cleveland was having riots, uh, you know, factories were closing, there was white flight, the, the Cuyahoga River caught fire. <laughs> it was bad, it was a bad time. And in a way, Cleveland has never recovered, but he sat down and wrote this letter to the school children of Cleveland. And in it, he explains what is equality, which he describes as conditions in which um, no one is held back um, by virtue of race or other qualities, but everyone has equal opportunity and can live in relative decency. The poverty doesn't hold you back. Lack of education doesn't hold you back. Um, so it's, it's material conditions. And then self-government, which he describes as the, the right and the ability to participate in the running of your own affairs, yeah. whether it's local, state, national. And he spoils the American experience down to those two ideas in a simple letter to the school children of Cleveland. And how was he able to do that? Because his spirit, he had a crystal spirit. It was the spirit of someone who lived that, who didn't mm -hmm. need to learn it, who didn't need to be reminded of it, who didn't betray it um, when it was convenient, but who lived it. And um, so I can't say enough about Bayard Rustin and those ideas take the book to its home. It, they land the book in what I call equal America, which is a, an America where that passion for equality is realized and the, the, um, the barriers between groups and identities and the relentless inequality that we've seen um, throughout our history, especially recently, begins to be reversed by policy, but also by individual action. So there is some hope at the end, and that may have been what you were yeah. feeling. Finish. And and also, you know, something that I really agree with you on, you, you mentioned that we might need to just simply create some mechanisms for meeting each other again, and for, for meeting people that we don't necessarily run into in our corner of America, through some type of national service or something like that. Uh, and you know, it's, it, I, I think it's a, it's a compelling idea that you end on and a vision that I want to, I certainly want to end up on. Um, somehow we've managed to speak exactly for 45 minutes. And so uh, you have actually quite a lot of questions waiting for you. And the first one I like, and just want to hear your answer as a fan. Um, can you talk about some of the non, uh, nonfiction that has influenced your most recent writing? Any particular novels or films or why not records? Records. <laughs> yeah. Hamilton. That's anonymous. H Hamilton pretty much took over my family for about two years. It's all we listened to in the car. The kids had the entire soundtrack memorized and we would all just break into cabinet battle number one 
spontaneously. And it also became a civics class that my children could have because they weren't getting a whole lot of it at, at their own schools. Um, in terms of writers, I try to read fiction all the time when I'm writing, not always when I'm researching, but once I sit down to write, I want the best fiction in my head. I don't want research. I don't want journalism. I don't want, God knows, I don't want social media in my head. What I want is, um, you know, Elena Ferrante. I, I, I loved the, the Neapolitan novels. Um, I want Bleak House. Um, I want, um, Brothers Karamazov, these are books I, I've read in the last year. Thomas Mann's Magic Mountain. Um, it just, I, I can't, it, it kind of breaks my heart that these classics are not taught so much anymore in school. That there's a sense in which it's no longer relevant. I see that in my kids' ed education and I see it in stories about education, but um, Toni Morrison said, how do you get children to want to read? You give them good books. You give them stuff that is the best literature. And in nonfiction, I mean, I can't get enough of Baldwin. I can't get enough of Orwell. I, um, I am not a huge Didion fan, but a few of her essays really sing to me. Um, and then some of my contemporaries and even my friends, people like Bill Finnegan of The New Yorker and um, Alec McGillis's recent book about Amazon fulfillment, which is a really important book. Um, Lawrence Wright's books about everything. Um, we are sort of living in or maybe toward the end of a golden age of narrative journalism mm -hmm. over the last 20 years or so. And I think we'll look back and say, just as media was making itself more and more trivial uh, because of the loss of its financial base, et cetera, um, there was also this great writing uh, essays and narrative journalism that um, probably took the place of fiction in a lot of people's yeah. reading habits. Yeah. yeah. Um, you get good questions here, I got to say. All right. Uh, <laughs> I'll, I'll, I'll be brief then. I'll, I'll be succinct. From Jay Ruiz, uh, were there any stories or passages that didn't make it into the final book, whether because of length or direction of argument that you felt sad to lose? Hmm. Well, this one will speak to you, Thomas. I had a little page about the experience you and I shared last summer mm. as uh, co-organizers of what became known as the Harper's Letter, um, because I'd never written about the experience itself. What was it like? Because there were a lot of interesting things going on behind the scenes. And right. I thought it'd be an interesting to just kind of tell the story. My editor said, you don't need to do that. That had its moment. Uh, got a lot of attention. It'll just be a distraction from what you're trying to do here. And he was right. And I, I had to cut it. And when an editor is right, you got to just listen to them. You can't fight it. Uh, it may take a little while to get there. But the, the passages in my books that I regret leaving in my books are almost always passages that some editor suggests. Told you to take out. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so there's one answer to Jay Ruiz. <laughs> um from anonymous with regards to the rhetoric around self-government is it possible to rescue that notion away from the coke backed push into libertarianism which has seemingly taken over the space around individualism in politics i think if we use that language and if we take the word freedom away from the plutocratic libertarians for whom freedom is the freedom to destroy the planet or freedom is the freedom to pay no taxes on billion dollar incomes, then yeah. But if you abandon the language to them and, and if the word freedom makes you uncomfortable because Reagan used it or uh, Newt Gingrich or Ted Cruz used it, then you'll, you'll lose that argument. So I think if, I think in their hearts, most Americans know that simply destroying our ability to govern, um, whether by cutting it to the bone or by denuding the IRS so that it can't audit rich people or, or, or simply using language that debases us has not helped us. It hasn't brought people up, it's, it's dragged people down. So I think if we use that language in a way that says freedom is the freedom to 
to live by your own choices. But that ability depends on social conditions, on whether you have the strength to participate in our political and economic systems. If you don't, if you're just trying to survive, if you're working at an Amazon warehouse, uh, the night shift and just getting by, you can't, you're not free. You can't participate right. in our political and economic system. And I think if we keep saying that, then we will take, we'll take back language that has been kind of co-opted and maybe debased by cynical people for their own purposes. So this is a good question too. It's related maybe, it's different than just who are you reading as a fan. It's from Inez Schroeder. Who are some of the contemporary cultural and political critics you read uh, and whom you might be arguing with in this book? Mm. That's a great question. Yeah. Ta-Nehisi Coates, um, who's had a huge influence both on our culture and on me. Um, and I, I think he's a wonderful writer. And I also am arguing with him a lot in my head. And we even got into an argument in print once. And it, I think we both came out of it. I hope he felt, I certainly felt that we treated each other with, with respect and managed to find a way to have a pretty serious argument without um, drawing blood. And um, so C Coates is certainly one. Um, I'll try to think of others. There, there may be some on the right because I find that there's a type of never Trump Republican who I am more and more drawn to who seems, who I know I disagree with completely about taxes and the welfare state and social democracy, but who I admire for being willing to go against the tribe. That and lonely broad, road. <laughs> yeah, and broads wrath. Um, and, and yet um, stand up for values that go beyond just political partisanship, what I call liberal values. So there, that group of people, people like Peter Weiner, for example, he's a writer for the Atlantic. He was a George W. Bush White House aide and an evangelical Christian. And in, in every way, someone different from me. And yet I always read him because I think he's um, doing something quite brave. Adam Serwer of the Atlantic, uh, a younger writer, I think he's a terrific writer and a, a really honest one. I don't agree with some of his ideas, um, but I, I always read him knowing that he's, um, he's gonna play it straight and that he's gonna think hard and write well. And those are the qualities that I admire. So in some ways, a political disagreement is less important mm -hmm. than, than admiration for a writer as a writer. I wish we had more of that, but we seem incapable of admitting that we like someone's work if we disagree with their politics. I blame social media for that in, in so many ways. Um, well, do you think there's, I think this is from another anonymous, do you think there's anything potentially positive about nationalism that can be used in the 21st century or has that well been completely poisoned by Trump's spin on it? So here's another word I would um, take back and not nationalism, which I do think has the connotation of aggression, uh, maybe even hatred, violence, exclusion, but patriotism, which doesn't mean beating down other countries and forcing our way on them and um, chanting USA, USA. Patriotism, I think of as an extension of family loyalty. I see it in a similar way to my love and loyalty for my family, which no matter what, how hard I might try to be uh, a universal humanist, I have to acknowledge that my first love and yeah. for my family. I think that's human. And to me, the same is true for my country. It's a different kind of love and loyalty, but it's there. It's a feeling that, does, that doesn't go away unless you really try to kill it or unless your circumstances sort of erode it until it disappears, which I think has happened to some Americans. Um, but what happens if that, if you lose it is, first of all, the ability to do big things as a country depends on it. You cannot combat racism 
reverse inequality, stop global warming, save democracy without national solidarity. These are too big for one tribe or one party. And patriotism is the glue and the, the motor that can allow us to, uh, to take them on. Because if you don't love the country, what's the point of trying to solve these problems? So patriotism is something I talk about quite a bit in the book. Bayard Rustin and other historical figures I write about had no trouble being left-wing patriots. That was not a contradiction. Frances Perkins, the, the great New Dealer, she was a, a progressive patriot. But today it feels almost like a contradiction and I think that's a great loss. From Claudia Kuntz, so will the GOP have to deliver material support to the real Americans or will white panic suffice? They've gotten quite far on white panic. <laughs> uh, and there may be, <laughs> being something of a materialist, that is someone who thinks first about how people are living concretely, I'm shocked at how well they've done without offering anything in the way of material improvement. I think Biden is a politician in the mode of equal America. I think he, his domestic policies are largely driven by a sense that we need to improve conditions for the majority of people. We need to empower workers. We need to take power away from giant corporations um, and break up monopolies. To me, those are the key ingredients of, um, of, of a policy of equal America. And I think if that can happen, and if it includes the real Americans, if they are part of it, whether they want to be or not, that's the only way the temperature can start to go down. We're not going to persuade people of anything. We're not going to convert them. We're not going to show them the error of their ways and point out how foolish it is to vote against your interests, as people say. Um, that only drives people further into the arms of the demagogue. But if we can slowly rebuild the working class and restore or create some of the conditions of equality, um, I think the level of vitriol might diminish. And with it, the, uh, the, the specter of the country breaking up or in some ways falling apart. That's my bet. I think we have time for one more question, um, and it's kind of related uh, from John Byers. Who are some actual thinkers, writers who represent real America and who aren't just white supremacists or conspiracists? It has a pretty impoverished literature. Um, that may be something that I don't know whether that has helped it with the mass of Americans, but it certainly hasn't helped it in the sort of the competition for cultural supremacy. But um, there are interesting philosophers, um, writers, like, um, you know, I'm going to forget when I'm put on the spot like this, I always forget people's names. There's a Harvard law professor who's a, a conservative Catholic. I think Adrian Vermeule is, is his name or something. He has mm -hmm. a last name who writes about, he's sort of willing to attack the foundations of the enlightenment. He's like a monarchist. Or something. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He believes in going back to a pre-enlightenment um, hierarchy uh, in which <laughs> kings and priests um, are, I, I'm probably distorting it. So forgive me if I am. Um, Patrick Deneen, who wrote a book about the, um, yeah, the, the failure of liberalism and of the modern world and, and the need to, um, to go back to some form of identity that isn't fragile and 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 fluid like modern identities are. Um, there's a whole anti-liberal, I suppose, strain mm -hmm. in the support for Trump, which in some ways, I don't want to exaggerate this, but in some ways mirrors the anti-liberal strain on the left. Mm -hmm. Both of them have lost faith in the Enlightenment, in rationality and science and um, due process and the idea of individual equality and freedom. And instead, I think we, we have to have stronger medicine because liberalism has not solved our problems and in fact has um, led us into a kind of a terrible 
dead end in which nothing means anything. Mm -hmm. There's a desire for meaning and for community that is constantly being felt by modern people because uh, modern life is constantly eluding it. And so they turn back to other forms of identity. And that's something that I think has driven the, the Trump reaction as well. Um, we, in some ways we are right to call it racism, but it might have other contours that aren't quite so easily defined and that um, may even be in some ways more dangerous, although racism is about as dangerous as it gets. Racism is compounded in these other things. It's kind of like the, the bitter poison that's at the heart of a lot of other ideas. So um, that, yeah. that, I don't know that I've named a whole lot of writers, but I've tried to describe philosophically what's interesting about Trump. And you've written about this, Thomas, with the white identitarian movement in France, which has a lot of um, traffic with the American version. Yeah, it does. I just, I wonder, is it, uh, that question was fascinating to me because I wonder if, if real America in some ways is a, is a place without real thinkers. May, that's probably too simplistic, but I, it, it made me wonder, and I couldn't name any off the top of my head. Um, someone in the chat mentioned Megan Kelly, but she's, she's a journalist, but she, I, think, I think the question was asking for writers. So I, 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 I'm going to think about that some more. Um, unfortunately, we're out of time. I would love to talk to you um, for two or three or four Joe Rogan-like hours, but I think that Hal is, Hal is going <laughs> to... I come. I'm the worst part about the event because I'm ending it. But um, as always... Look, George, Thomas, you need to get some sleep. So I yeah. <laughs> Thomas okay. needs to get some sleep. Is extremely <laughs> late. He's, too, he's in from Paris, which we didn't mention. But uh, so a huge thank you to Thomas, the MVP of the event, staying up late, asking great questions. George, as always, wonderful working with you. Wonderful seeing you. Thanks. Um, and for everyone, uh, thank you for joining us. And one thing that... Yes, the book. Yeah. One thing that By I wanted to... <laughs> by the book. Um, one thing that I do want to do is post a link to the book, which I should have had ready, but I was just so captivated by that last answer that involved monarchism of all things. Um, and so I am posting that in the chat one more time before we all leave. Um, so please click that link, check it out. We'll have plenty of copies at the bookstore if you're local. Um, and otherwise, George, Thomas, thank you so much. And uh, this was lovely. And everybody have a lovely evening. And thank support, you, Hal. Thank you, George. Community Bookstore and in every bookstores everywhere. Thank you guys. We'll see you all soon, hopefully in person. Good night. Yeah.